Reading is taken from Matthew chapter 6, 19 to 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasures is, there your heart will be also. This is the reading of God. All right, good morning, church. Uh, if you're visiting or your guest here, my name is Ken. I'm one of the pastors here at the church, and you've caught us in the middle of a, a great sermon series called Spiritual Disciplines. And what this series is about is that we're looking at various ways in which we as Christians uh, can practice uh, these spiritual practices in order for us to draw closer to God, in order for us to become uh, more like Jesus. And so we're in the middle of this series there. Uh, we've gone through a few of these spiritual disciplines week after week, and today we're coming up on, on uh, another one. Um, so last week we had um, the spiritual discipline of silence. And, and uh, the challenge was, what does it mean for us to really uh, stop and to listen uh, to listen to God, to turn off noise in our environment, to turn off noise in our lives, and to also even come to God uh, without an agenda, to not just dictate to God uh, what we're asking for all the time, but just to really listen. And so I hope you've had a, a challenging week with that discipline if you tried to practice any of those things uh, this past week. But I just want to take us, uh, again, just take a step back for us to remember a few things about spiritual uh, disciplines. And the idea of spiritual disciplines, again, is, is that it's a place for us uh, to be before God so that God can change us, so that God can transform us. And so these spiritual disciplines, they really, they really don't do much. Um, it's really because you are allowing God uh, to really be in your life that God ends up being the one who changes you. And, and so that's always a caution with spiritual disciplines. It's never about what you do. Like just because you're in solitude or just because you're fasting or just because you're in silence, it doesn't mean that you've done something and God is now uh, responding. It means you're being available to God and God is actually using you. And, and so with us today, uh, as we continue with that, just to, remember, just to remind you, like, you can practice these spiritual disciplines as we go through them week after week. Or you could take, after the whole series, you could take up one and just think, hey, what do I want to do and try to engage in that. But again, this is not to earn brownie points. It's not to, to impress God. It's to make yourself available to God so that God can do deep, deep work in our lives uh, to transform us to be more like Jesus. And so today, we are coming on what's called uh, the spiritual discipline of simplicity. Simplicity. Uh, to keep it simple, stupid, right? The KISS principle. And the reality is, is that this spiritual discipline is actually something we're not very comfortable with as well. And in fact, uh, I think a lot of us, will, we, as, as I speak today, maybe we will find some areas of our life that we're just going to be really stuck with and we're really going to think through. Because the reality is, we think simple is not smart enough. Or we think simple is not good enough. After all, when we try to do things, we like to make things, uh, the, the more complex something is or the more complicated it is, that means it's probably worth more value. Or the bigger words that we use in our talk and in our expressions means that somehow you're smarter. And the whole concept of the spiritual disciplines is to totally pull all that away and just say, really, at the core of it, who are you and who is God and what do you really value? What do you really value in life? And so the spiritual discipline, really, of simplicity, you can look at it this way. It's intentionally uncluttering your life to give God more room to operate. It's intentionally uncluttering your life in order to give God more room to operate. And this is actually a very inward spiritual discipline. It's a very inward spiritual discipline that, as we practice it internally, it expresses itself outside, externally, eventually. And so what can happen is things like if you practice the spiritual discipline of, of simplicity in your speech, um, the things that we say will then become more truthful and more honest. If you practice it with the things that you're doing in life, you will find that there is greater freedom to not be so constrained uh, with expectations and with, um, with keeping up with other people. It's the idea of stop showing our extravagance especially when we can't afford the extravagances we're trying to show. It makes us more available to people 
um, in order for us to love people. Because far too much, we like to keep busy. And we like to keep busy to the point that we're not even available for others as well. So why do we need to do this and and what are some of the, the reasons why? Because here's the problem. We believe today that excess is a standard of success. Do you hear that? We believe that somehow if we have excess, we have then succeeded. If we have more stuff to show people, then we have somehow made it. If our house is bigger than the average house, somehow we've made it. If our cars are more expensive, if our clothes are more fashionable and up-to-date, if we have the latest technology, if we have the latest gadgets, if we have more and more stuff, we believe somehow that we have succeeded. And I want to share with you that that principle or that concept is is a complete falsehood in our day and age. And what happens with us is then we start to compete and compete for attaching to these things. And we make decisions to keep up with other people because we're afraid of what people will think when we don't keep up. We keep up with other people because we're afraid of missing out on the next thing. For you young people, you call it FOMO. We fear missing out. And so we start cluttering our lives, we start busying ourselves, we start accumulating stuff, we start posting as much as we can on social media to show that stuff, and it becomes so much that we lose a bit of who we are and we lose a bit of what our purpose is in life. And here's what happens, is that for a lot of us, because when that starts to happen, when Christ is no longer at the center of, our, of who we are, we start to attach ourselves to things. And when we attach ourselves to things, we start living our lives to build those things. And those things are sometimes called money. Those things are sometimes called status. Those things are sometimes called square footage. Those things are sometimes called cars. Those things are sometimes called degrees. Those things are sometimes called the bank account. Those things, those things, those things. And eventually what happens is those things become our God. And the whole point of this discipline is to practice removing those things and to really see again, who is really your God? Is it the one that we worship on Sunday that we call the Lord Jesus Christ? Or is it all these things that we have attached ourselves to in our day and age? Affluence today is actually psychotic, if you really think about it. Because it's not real. Kim Kardashian's life is not real. Angelina Angelina Jolie, who you see on the screens, she's not real. She has a real life that you don't see. Kylie Jenner, who you follow on Instagram, what she posts is not real. And what you and I post all the time on our Facebooks and Instagrams and TikToks and YouTubes, those really aren't real about who we are because we're not always on vacation. We're not always eating out at fancy restaurants, taking pictures of this food and showing everyone what it is, are we? That happens only once in a while. Because no one sees when you bake a cake and it sucks and you won't post it. You try to bake your child's birthday cake and it's horrible. This is my wife. She bakes a birthday cake. It looks horrible. She'll post it. It's like, it doesn't matter. It's real. It's real. People don't see your day-to-day lunch. People don't see your day-to-day dinners. And in fact, maybe if we really step back, maybe we're afraid to show that because we're worried about what people really think of us. And that has become our God. And so, you know, we feel ashamed if we're not wearing the latest clothes or, in fact, if our clothes are maybe a little bit worn out, where if we feel ashamed, or if our cars are a bit worn down, we feel a little bit of embarrassment with it. And you know what's really funny about all this? If you really take a step back to think about it, we buy all these things to impress people we do not like. Have you ever noticed that? That we do all these things to impress people we don't really know, and in fact, probably people we don't even really like. So why? Why do we do all this? Because we're conditioned to think that if we are out of step with what's going on, that we're behind or we're out of the loop or we're not in line with reality. And we fear that. So what does the Bible say about this idea of simplicity? 
The idea is simple. The Bible has a lot to say thing, about things about wealth. He's not, the Bible's not against wealth. God is not against wealth. But God is against the exploitation of the poor to accumulate wealth. God is against the injustices that we cause when we're trying to accumulate stuff. But the reality is wealth happens, but then God says, what are you going to do with that which I entrust to you? And so for many of us, when we are really blessed by God, um, the question is, is it really about showing people what we have? Or is the thing, am I supposed to use this to benefit the kingdom of God? Is God and his purpose is still the number one priority when you have all this stuff? So I'm going to take you through a, 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 a whirlwind of scripture verses just to sort of point some, some areas out to you. We're going to start, if you have your Bible, I'm going to encourage you to turn it on, open up. Um, keep a bookmark at Matthew, uh, where we were this morning, Matthew, uh, what is it, six, six, uh, Matthew 6, uh, verses 9 and 20. Just sort of keep a finger there. But if you have a Bible, just want to jump you to Leviticus 25, uh, 23 is where we're going to start. And it's a very simple passage. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be uh, hopefully up on the screen. Uh, here's where it starts. The land, um, here's what Leviticus says. The land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you reside in my land as foreigners and strangers. This is God's instruction to his people. And this is an agricultural society at this point. And he's reminding them that the land that they're on belongs to God. And in, you know, for us here, maybe you don't think about this, but you know, your home belongs to God. I know you have a mortgage. I know you bought it but it belongs to God. Have you thought about that? And then the question is, are you using that as a place where God's work will be done? Or is my home a home to show people, to have a status for people, to have people see the accumulation of things? Is my home a place where I can just store so much treasure on earth that I can't even park my car in the garage anymore, even though that's what the purpose of a garage was? Is my home so full of stuff that I never use it? It's just there. It just looks beautiful and it looks attractive. But it's never used for God's purposes and for God's glory. Psalm 62.10 says, um, we looked at this last week when it came to the discipline of silence. It says, do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Uh, though, your heart, you, though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. God is reminding us again of a very simple principle of, you know, just because there's an accumul- accumulation of riches, do not put all your trust in that. For many of us uh, who are, you know, you're on those years, you're, you're coming to those years of retirement, and where, how, how is your RRSPs done, and how have your investments done? And God just says, you know, do not put your heart into those things. Remind ourselves again, how will I use this for the kingdom of God? The things, my bank account, is it being used for God's glory? The 10th commandment in Exodus reminds us uh, of this as well. Um, in Exodus 20. Um, it says this, uh, You shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The idea of coveting is the, the idea of just wanting what other people have. It's almost like the idea of what we, we say, that we have this adage in, in Western civilization that says, you know, keeping up with the Joneses and, you know, oh, my neighbor got a new car, I need to get a new car. Oh, my neighbor got a new flat screen TV, I need to get a flat screen TV because the Super Bowl, you know, was just last week. And, you know, like, uh, or they're, they're doing uh, landscaping, I got to do landscaping now, right? They're, they're renovating the house, they're renovating the kitchen, oh, I got I to gotta do that too. And we just keep comparing and comparing and with the onset of slow, uh, social media, we, we can compare so much more so quickly all the time. And we start to get jealous. Oh, they get to go on vacation again? What? They're in Cuba again? What? They get to go there? And we start to covet and we start to want that. And the Bible reminds us, don't do that. That's not what God's purpose for us is. Jesus went to battle against materialism in Luke chapter 16. He also says this in verse uh, 13. He says, um, No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. 
And it's, it's all these verses are just reminding us again that the freedom of simplicity is to, to draw back away from stuff, from things, from the material things that we have, to draw back from all of that and to say, where is your heart's desire really? And if all I'm doing is living for paycheck after paycheck, if all I'm doing is trying to pay off debt because I've bought things that I cannot afford, we're not living the way God has intended for us to live. God in John 10, uh, Jesus in John 10, 10 said, um, you know, I came to give you life and life to the full. And sometimes we misconstrue that as I must have uh, a busy life. I must have a lot of things. And the reality is that's not what Jesus is saying. He says I, the idea of full is that you would have purpose. You would have value. Uh, you, you, you are dignified because of who God is. And so what happens over time is that when we replace God at our center with all these things, we will no longer treat ourselves with the dignity, value, and worth as people made in the image of God, and you will no longer treat other people in your relationship circles as people who are created in the image of God who also have that same dignity, value, and worth. And when you look globally, you will look at all the people out there in the world and realize when Scotiabank says you're richer than you think, that those people who are being exploited uh, out in the world, that you would stand for justice because that's God's heart not to exploit uh, and to use what you have to make things right in the world and to advance the kingdom of God. That's what the freedom of simplicity does for us. It's about retuning our antenna to God again. God intends that we should have adequate provisions in our life, that all our needs for sure will be met but not all our wants and desires are always going to be met. Our needs, God's provision of needs, will always be met, but not always our wants and desires. See, the spiritual discipline of simplicity sets us free to receive from God the things that we truly need as a gift. And in fact, when we receive those things as a gift, his desire is that those gifts not be hoarded only for ourselves, but that they're to be given to others around us. That if I am a gift of God, I'm to be given to my wife, to my kids, to my small group, to my community, to non-believers. I'm to be poured out as a gift to others. But if we're pursuing stuff, then all our time and our schedules are just filled with pursuing stuff. And we're never accomplishing what God has really intended for us to do. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8, um, there's this great passage here. It's a longer passage. We, I won't read the whole thing, but if you want, uh, Deuteronomy ch uh, chapter 8, you could read in verses 10 to, to 18. It, God warns the Israelites. He's warning them um, that if w things will go well with you, things are going to go well in the land that you're going to receive. And, and it's a reminder that things will go well with you. But when things go well with you, the reality is there is a tendency to forget God. And he warns Israel when the land, in the land that when things are going to go well, do not forget who I am. And he's reminding us that when things go well in our lives, do not forget who God is. In Luke chapter 12, uh, Jesus tells the story of a parable of the rich fool who, who has the idea to, to build, he has these storage uh, places to store his grains. And he says to himself, I'm going to tear all this down and build bigger ones so I can accumulate more stuff. And in fact, one of the things when you look at this whole parable is that this person has absolutely no one to talk to. He's actually talking to himself because all he's doing is going after stuff in his life that he has no one to talk to, no one to share it with. He has a conversation with himself only because he's just worried about getting more stuff. And the Lord says to him, you fool, you fool, you fool. When you die, you're not taking anything with you. And he reminds us of that. This very night, your life will demand it from you and, and it'll go nowhere. And you've wasted your life. A very popular verses we like to quote in Philippians 4, verses 11 to 13 says, it talks about, you know, I can do all things, right, through Christ's strength. But the idea of that passage is contentment, is the idea that Paul saying, I have had nothing and I have had plenty, but no matter what the circumstances, I am content with Christ. I am content with God and with Christ, who is everything to me. 
And that was way, the way Paul was positing that idea. And my question is, if God took all of your bank account and made it zero, if God took all of your degrees and wiped them away, if God took away your job, if God took away your house, would you still be content with God as the only person left? Would you? And we have the story of Job who lost everything and still did not curse God and still relied fully on God and blessed God. So how do you do this, this idea of simplicity? How, how are you supposed to practice this in your everyday life? And so maybe I want to offer you some pointers as to how we can practice this. Maybe the first thing for us to think about in our day and age of buying things, you know, um, uh, there was a study done recently on Amazon. Uh, apparently, we've, we've become so accustomed to doing things without thinking that there have been studies done that people actually get drunk and just buy things on Amazon. Like that, that's how much excess we tend to have that we can, and how accessible shopping is to us, that people can get completely wasted and drunk, and it's actually fun for some people, and they order things on Amazon, and it's like, oh, what, what's coming tomorrow? I have no idea what I did. I mean, that's how much excess we can have in our, in our Western world here in Canada and the United States. And so the question, maybe one thing for us to think about, perhaps we need to understand that we should buy things more for their usefulness rather than for their status that we should consider buying things for their usefulness rather than for their status. You know the latest iPhone? Do you really, really need that? The thousand plus dollars that it's going to take to buy that? Or the latest MacBook? I'm not uh, against Apple by any means. Actually, maybe I am. Um, like, or, or the car? Like, do you really need to buy the brand new car with all the bells and whistles and, and you know, the certain brand names, like the German ones, like BMW, Mercedes, or, or would the, you know, the Chevy do just as well? And, and the difference between that two, the money that you save between those two, would you consider giving that away for God's kingdom somewhere? You know that iPhone you wanted to buy and say, you know what, what if you just bought a used iPhone because you're buying it for its usefulness and that money, that $1,000 iPhone to the $200 iPhone, that $800 that you have in between, maybe that could go for some kind of work in God's kingdom? And this is the kind of thing that we would buy things for their usefulness, not for their status. Our cars, our phones, our homes, our condos, our clothes. How much of what we have is really to impress people? How much of what we have is really there to impress people? And so maybe it's for us to consider buying things for their usefulness rather than for their status. Perhaps we need to reject things that can cause addictions in our lives. Rejecting areas that can cause addiction in our lives. So if you're addicted to TV... Get rid of the TV. And in fact, you'll probably find that you'll have better conversations with your family members and you'll, you'll have better uh, things going on in your mind. And if you're addicted to Netflix, cancel the Netflix subscription. If you're addicted to cable, get rid of the cable. If you're addicted to books, put down the books. If you're addicted to music all the time, turn off the music. If you're addicted to any kind of media, if you're addicted to your phone, just put it away. Because the things that cause addiction for us become problems. Now, I want to say this. The idea of simplicity is that if we get rid of some of these things that are addictive, uh, addiction requires more than just getting rid of it, okay? It requires help. It requires accountability. It requires vulnerability. It requires healing. It requires community. It requires friends. It requires family. And so I, I don't want to just say if you're having an addiction, just get rid of it and you'll be fine. There's more to it than that. But that's a start. It's that you have to acknowledge that these things are addictive and maybe we, maybe we need to get rid of them. Develop a habit of giving things away. Develop the habit of giving things away. One of the worst things that we have in our society is, is, um, is clothes. Like, we get rid of clothes so quickly. There's, we make clothes, and, and, and we get rid of them so quickly uh, when the, um, the Super Bowl is just finished, correct? And, and you know that uh, there's a winning team, and there's a losing team. And the winning team, they put on their championship hats, they put on their championship shirts, you know the losing team also printed championship hats and championship shirts, right? They just get rid of them, right? They just get rid of them. They end up in places around the world, but they just get rid of them. And maybe there are things in our lives, we just get, get rid of things. Give them away. Because if you can give them away, you know it doesn't have a hold on you. And you know, there are things that we can upcycle and recycle. It's also green to give things away rather than having people buy them. And you know, hey, uh, and I'll be honest, if you have little girls and you want clothes, we still have them. We'll give them away, right? If you, if you have like baby stuff and you see another couple coming along with a baby, like give it away, right? Why, why, spend them, why, why make them spend money to buy things? Learn to, like, we need to learn to give things away and give things away without condition. To give things away without condition. 
Just say, oh, here it is, it's just for you. Do whatever you please with it, right? Be aware of gadgets. Be aware of things. Do they really save you time? Do they really do what they're supposed to do? Um, I'm a person who looks at kitchen gadgets a lot. When I go out with my wife, I tend to stop in kitchen stores and I look at kitchen gadgets. Um, but I'm also disciplined enough not to buy them all the time. But the reality is, you don't need an avocado slicer that does things. It's called a knife. You already have one, right? I, I, there are a lot of things out there. You know, you want to make your avocado smash toast, you millennials, right? Like, you, you, you don't need to buy an avocado slicer. It's only designed to, to do that one thing, but the knife is designed to do more than just that one thing, right? And you already have it. And so is it really going to save you time? Is it really something that will, will benefit you? Is it only for one-time use? Um, and reality is a lot of things that we buy really break down very quickly. They really break down very quickly. So be aware of gadgets. Uh, learn to maybe enjoy things without owning them. Learn to enjoy things without owning them. Because the idea is that if we own something, we feel we can control it, and when we can control it, we, we derive pleasure from it. So this past year, I've decided I'm not buying a book for myself. I'm going to the library. I don't own those books, and I'm going to the library, and I'm going to grab books from the library, and I'm going to read them, and then I'm going to return them because I think I have an addiction to books, right? And, and so that's, that's something that, that I've started practicing over the last couple months is to just, I have a library card, and I live in Mississauga, and we have a lot of libraries. I don't need to always buy a book and put it on my bookshelf so people see, ooh, Ken, you read a lot of books. Yeah, I do, but what am I impressing? And in the great words of the great Shania Twain, that don't impress me much, right? Jesus' instruction is also, I want to take you to Matthew chapter 5, verse 37. Jesus has a great instruction for us here. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, uh, Jesus reminds us, sorry, verse 37. He reminds us of something. I, let me backtrack to verse 33, though. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you've made. But I tell you, do not swear on an, an oath at all, either by heaven or for God, or for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of, of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Verse 37 says this, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. I, I love the idea that Jesus is saying here. He's saying there's also simplicity that we can practice in our speech. Uh, other verses say it this way, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now, for those of you who come from an Asian culture, I, I'm just going to pick on this a little bit. You know how, and you've heard me say this before, for those of you who come from an Asian culture, so you know how sometimes no, 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 no means yes? And you know how sometimes we, you know, that's what it happens? Um, and, and you know the reality is that sometimes we do that, and Jesus says, no, just let your yes be yes and your no be no. And you know, um, uh, when, when you, you, uh, someone invites you somewhere and they say, would you like to come over? Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Oh, yes, that'd be great. No, I'm not available. Don't give me the no because, you know, I got all this stuff I got to do. I'm going to be here and I'm going to be there. Gonna... Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. Because in the simplicity of speech, you're not having to give excuses. You're not having to impress people. You don't have to use fancy words to try to show people how smart you are. Right? You're just simply letting yes be yes and no be no. And you know what else this simplicity of speech is? It avoids flattery. It avoids manipulation. It avoids half-truths. It's about being honest. It's about having integrity. Those will be the distinguishing character, the characteristics of your speech when you let your yes be yes and your no be no. You know how kids do this great? Oh, mom, you're looking really slim today. Can I go out with my friends? <laughs> hey, dad, see you've been working out. Can you buy me a new car? You know those words of flattery. I know they're not as extreme uh, with regards to maybe like that, but I think we should check ourselves at times because I think sometimes we say things in order to butter people up a bit. And Jesus says, you know what? Stop impressing people. I see your heart. 
I may not see your heart, you may not see my heart, and you, I may not see your heart, but God sees. And so maybe that's something for us to consider in, in the simplicity of our speech. We can reject jargon, we can reject abstract speculation, we can stop saying so many things that muddle people and muddle the main message of what we're talking about and we, things won't be obscure anymore. And, and again, we don't have to impress. Spend the time to impress God and show God how much you love him rather than the, the prestige of other people or the, the encouragement of other people or the applause of other people. Reject things that breed the oppression of others. I love my morning coffee. But do we consider where your morning coffee comes from? I love the clothes that I wear, but do we consider where those clothes come from? Do those things breed on the oppression of other people? Does my coffee come from a place in Latin America that exploits people? Does, do my clothes come from a place in Asia that exploits people. And I know that many of us look for a good deal or look for things that are cheap, but God says again, if I give you your bank account, make sure your wealth is not at the expense or at the exploitation of others. And the last thing to maybe for us to consider, reject anything that distracts us from seeking the kingdom of God first. If your job is not about the kingdom, think about it again. If your relationships are not about the kingdom, think about it again. If what we do as a church is not about the kingdom, we should think about it again. And if my money and my clothes and my car and my house are not being used for the kingdom, think about it again. And if we were to practice this discipline of simplicity, this freedom of simplicity, there are great benefits to it. We will really um, experience a greater sense of the presence of God. Because we're, we're getting rid of stuff, we're getting stuff out of the way, we're getting the obstacles out of the way, we're carving stuff out of our life and saying, God, this is not important, you're important. And when God says, oh, you finally recognize that? Great, I'll show up. And you will experience the presence of God in ways that are, are different from what you're experiencing today. You'll experience greater what's called contentment. There's a great freedom and contentment with the fact that you're not bound to try to get more, more, more. You're not sitting there worried, well, what's the credit card going to say after Christmas? You're not worried about what people are thinking. There's contentment because I can just be who I'm supposed to be. I can be comfortable. They say, comfortable in my own skin because I don't have to live this life of trying to impress people or trying to be something I'm not. Because if I'm trying to be something I'm not, somewhere, someday, down the road, someone's going to know who I really am and that bubble is going to pop. And I can learn to have joy and contentment. And I can learn to have joy and contentment in doing one or two things really well. To do one or two things really well, rather than just doing a bunch of, bunch of things in mediocrity. For some of us, we need to refocus. We need to refocus and say, what are some of my priorities? Because really, some of our priorities really is to invest more time in our children. Or some of our priorities is to invest more time in my aging parents. And for some of us, it's to invest in more time in God's work. But we've let too much stuff get in the way of those things. We need to learn the joy of just doing a few things really well. The desire will grow to do spontaneous acts of love towards other people. Because if you're not trying to impress other people, you now have the freedom just to show love without return to other people. Some of our marriages need that. Some of our relationships with our kids need that. Some of our relationships with our parents need that. And some of our relationships at church need that. Because we're too concerned about what others think or we're too concerned about impressing other people, we don't love unconditionally. We love with too many conditions. There will be an increased desire to pray. There will be less time being spent online shopping. And you go, hey, I'm not online shopping. 
I've got some quiet time. I should just pray. You turn off the computer, you put down the phone, and you pray. There's a greater appreciation for the small things in life, the little things that go unnoticed day after day, the little acts of love that perhaps your spouse is giving you, the little funny comments that your kids make that make you laugh, the, the little things about creation that you miss. Um, it's, it's weird. I don't, I'm not like the greatest nature lover, uh, but sometimes when you walk home and you're at a slower pace and you notice the little tracks in the snow and you're like, oh, there was an animal. And then you went, what kind of animal? And you're trying to figure out the tracks. And you point it out to your kids. And they're like, oh, there's a bunny nearby. And they want to go find the bunny, right? Like, you're, you're just, there's just a greater appreciation for small things that go unnoticed. And you'll probably actually have more energy. I'm tired because I'm too busy. And I'm busy because I'm on this hamster wheel of trying to get more and do more to get things and to impress people that I don't really like and I'm not sure if people really like it and I'm not sure if people are going to like my post and I'm not sure and I'm just tired because I keep doing this and when you stop doing that, you probably have more energy. There are some dangers to the idea of the discipline of simplicity. I just want to point them out to you. Is the reality is this, is that um, it can lead you down a path of what we call legalism um, and I just want to caution you on this because you will find that some of this stuff will work for you and then you will demand that other people do it too. And, and that's not how this discipline is supposed to work. It's really, you will discover what works uh, for you and you will discover that other people will be different, right? And it's not to say that this is the only way uh, to do things. This is the only way to get spiritual. It's not. So, so I want to just... I just put that caveat there and say, remind you, this is not a legalistic practice. This is something that offers freedom, uh, there's a great book by Richard Foster. Richard Foster actually writes two, two really good, well, three really good books. Well, actually more. Um, sorry. So he, the whole, this whole series, uh, you can go to get a book called The Celebration of the Disciplines. And so he has this whole book on all these spiritual disciplines. Uh, but one book that I really enjoyed was actually his one book that he takes called The Freedom of Simplicity. If you ever have a chance, go to the library. Uh, and actually, you know what? I don't know if we have it in our church library. If we don't, I'm going to request that we have one there. And you can borrow it. Um, and so look for that book and, and just see how you can practice. And a lot of, uh, some of his stuff is in, in what I've been preaching here today. Now, here's what you can do this week if you want to try. I'm going to ask you uh, to consider some things. And as I do this, um, again, these are not things you have to do, but I just want to encourage you to try something this week. So you can write this down. Uh, or consider it, type it into your phone and consider it. As I'm doing that worship team, you can come on back up. Um, let me ask you this. What possession do you have in your life that you feel you can't live without? Is there a possession that you have in your life currently that you feel you can't live without? You know, I, and I, I know it's uh, hyperbole when kids say this, like, oh, I can't live without my phone, right? I can't live without my phone. Um, why? What's going on there that we need to consider? So maybe if you go about your week and think about that, or, or maybe this question is more poignant to you. What is the one purpose for your life? What is the one purpose for your life? Is it to get married? Is it to just have kids? Is it to just graduate? Is it to get to a good university? Is it to get a good job? Is it to have a good job? Is it to get a good money? And, and so ask that question. What is the one purpose of, my, of your life? Here's another question to think about throughout your week if you want to try. Do my activities and my routine fit with God's purpose for my life? Do the things that I do, the activities and the routines that I have, do they actually fit God's purpose in my life? And so these three questions, if you want to consider them throughout your week, um, they will put you in a place to just really hear from God and to maybe look at and re-examine what are our values really. And it really, we may have gone off center from Christ because we put so much value and emphasis in other things. And it's really an opportunity for us to get re-centered with Christ uh, so that we continue to live out of that centeredness, that Christ is at the center of, of how we live and what we do, so that there's great freedom to just be who God created you to be. He already knows who you are, and, and he already gifted you a certain way, and he's just dying to, to, to be involved with what, what uh, he wants you to be involved in what he's doing. And so oftentimes we miss out on that.